So good evening class, sorry just bit was away, uh, let's start the class. So today I will be taking off your tomorrow class also and today class also, we will merge them together. I will take the both topics today. And uh, yeah, so let's start. First topic that we'll be dealing today uh, will be chip. So today will be a bit long session till 10, 10, 15 maybe. But we will try to have everything done in time and not in haphazard way. That will be my goal. And uh, so that each thing could be explained and you can understand it uh, in easy manner. Happy Halloween students, today is happy Halloween day. So it used to be in Germany, we used to make that. We used to dress weirdly and yeah, then we party afterwards. So first thing first, chip. Uh, chip uh, is done to see the interaction between your DNA and protein and this technique is done for that chromatin immunoprecipitation principles. So today is day 7 actually. So chromatin immunoprecipitation. Here you have uh, cells they are cross linked and with the lysis sample and then they are lysed and then afterwards their antibody uh, binding is done 
then after the antibody uh, binding is done then we immunoprecipitate them then after immunoprecipitation uh, all the binded proteins with the dna with the antibody they will come out and then we cross link reversal we do the reversal cross link then we dna purify and quantitative uh, dna purification and quantitative pcr is done so at the end you have dna and protein analysis So what is chromatin immunoprecipitations? Not only do proteins interact with one another, they also interact with DNA. So chromatin immunoprecipitation is a technique that determines whether the protein of interest interacts with a specific DNA sequence. And this technique is often used to study the reproductivity of the sites that are bound by particular transcription factors or by histone proteins. And they took look at the precise genomic locations of various histones modifications including acetylations, phosphorylations or methylation. So how does chip work? So in this chip we examine the presence of protein DNA interaction at steady state or quantify the changes in the interaction at a specific phase of the cell cycle. So first, first thing first, protein and associated chromatins are temporarily cross-linked in live cells or tissues and sheared using enzymatic digestions or sonication to yield 300 to 1000 base pair fragments of DNA. And the protein of interest along with any dissociated DNA fragments in immunoprecipitated from the cell's debris using specific antibody. The cross link is then reversed and DNA fragments are purified and the amount of eluted DNA can be assessed through quantitative real time PCR using primers flanking the genomic locus of interest. Then DNA is amplified in an indications of enrichment in binding of the protein of interest. So they are modified chip techniques. So DNA fragments uh, purified by chip can be utilized for a number of downstream analysis techniques. Furthermore, the basic chip protocol described above can be modified to answer various biological questions. First is chip on chip. This is done to, do, to check the genome-wide analysis of proteins binding sites using microarray analysis of purified DNA fragments. Then there is a chip sequence genome-wide analysis of protein binding sites using deep sequencing of purified DNA fragments. Native chip, it omits the cross-linking steps and uses micrococal nucleus digestions to cut DNA at histone linkers to examine the DNA fragments targets of modifying proteins. And chip exo, uh, addition of exonucleus digestion step to obtain increased resolution of protein binding sites up to a single base pair. Then there is a, a CHIA chromatin interaction analysis by paired and tag sequencing. So a technique that combines the principle of chip with chromosome conformation capture to detect long range chromatin interaction mediated by protein of interest. Then I chip, this is indexing first chromatin immunoprecipitation, a high sensitivity technique that reduces the number of cells required for chip experiments by initially barcoding total cellular chromatin. Then NCHIP, this is engineer DNA binding molecule mediated uh, chromatin immunoprecipitations. This technique employs CRISPR Cas9 system to target specific genomic region. A guide RNA complementary to desired genomic region is expressed in combination with tagged enzymatically inactive Cas9 protein. Then is a RIP chip, RIP sequence, which is done analyzed to protein RNA interaction. There are some limitations, uh, such as there is a presence of proteins in genomic locus. It cannot determine the functional significance of protein binding at the re region. Uh, additionally, protein may mask the epitope of the protein of interest. 
and DNA interaction of proteins with short resistance times may not be fully captured in the in the case of chip. So some factors that have to take care while doing chip uh, that is antibody validations, garbage in out and out, and further uh, cell number considerations has to be taken care. Cross linking issues and appropriate controls. So these are the foremost most important things. As for any experiments, controls are um, indispensable to chip to calculate enrichment in protein binding and to interpret the significance of results. The following controls are recommended. So IgG uh, control should be there. So appropriate non-specific IgG is added instead of protein specific antibody but at the same uh, concentrations to give indication of the assay background. Then input control, you can say 5 to 10 percent of a cell lysis before addition of antibodies to normalize for variations in starting material between consecutive experiments. And then positive control locus, if possible a DNA regions where your protein of interest is known to bind should be examined. This will tell you if a chip experiments worked out. The negative control locus, if possible, DNA region where protein of interest is not expected to bind should be tested and this will tell you the chip experiment is specific. So let's start a video with it now. Me whisper something in your ear about chips seek. Yeah, that quest. Hello, I'm Josh Starmer and welcome to StatQuest. Today we have a gentle introduction to ChipSeq. Note, this StatQuest is based on the gentle introduction to RNA-Seq. So watch that first unless you're already totally down with RNA-Seq. Okay, we've got a bunch of cells. Inside each cell, there's a nucleus. And inside each nucleus, there are a bunch of chromosomes. Let's focus on the chromosomes. Specifically, let's focus on these chromosomes. Chromosomes are made out of chromatin. Chromatin is made out of DNA, plus histones, a type of protein, plus other proteins that we'll talk about some other day. They're not that important for understanding ChIP-seq. DNA wraps around the histones to package DNA and the packaging can regulate gene transcription. Depending on how they are modified, histones can activate or repress genes. Lots more can be said about chromatin and how it's packaged, but that's for another day. Today we just need to know that chromatin is essentially DNA wrapped around histones. To simplify things, let's just use this big blue line to represent chromatin from here on out but remembering that it's made of DNA and histone proteins. And let these big brown arrows represent genes. And let this green circle represent a histone that allows transcription. And let this red stop sign represent a histone that represses transcription. In a cell, all kinds of proteins can bind to DNA. This mustard colored thing might promote gene transcription of this gene. And this pinkish colored thing might repress this gene. And who knows what this green thing is doing? We can use CHIP-seq to find out. CHIP-seq stands for chromatin immunoprecipitation combined with high throughput sequencing. It identifies the locations in the genome bound by proteins. That's the most important thing in this stat quest, so I'll say it again, in bold. ChIP-seq identifies the locations in the genome bound by proteins. For example, say like we wanted to identify all the regions in the genome bound by the green thing. The first thing we do is use formaldehyde, or something like it, to glue all the proteins bound to the DNA together with the DNA. This means that all of the DNA-bound proteins, including the ones we're not interested in, are glued to the DNA. 
The next thing we do is cut the DNA up into small, approximately 300 base pair, fragments. Then we isolate the protein we're interested in, in this case, we're interested in the green thing, using an antibody. The black star represents an antibody that is attached to a bead. Then we isolate the proteins bound by the antibody and wash everything else away. Then we reverse the formaldehyde glue by warming up everything. Then we isolate the DNA by washing away the proteins, including the histones. Now that we see how to isolate DNA that is bound by a particular protein, let's take a step back. So far, the example has focused on just these chromosomes. But the process, glue proteins to DNA, cut up DNA, bind proteins of interest with antibodies, isolate antibodies, unglue and wash away proteins, applies to all the chromosomes in the cell. And it is usually applied to a pool of 6 million cells, give or take a few. So we end up with a lot of DNA fragments from a lot of cells. Then, just like with RNA-seq, we prepare a sequencing library by adding sequencing adapters to both ends of the DNA fragments. Then, just like RNA-seq, we PCR amplify the library, check the library concentration, sequence, filter out garbage reads, and then align the high-quality reads to a genome. That is to say, if this is the genome, the first read might come from here, a location on chromosome 2. The second read might come from here, a location on chromosome 1. The third read might come from here, another position on chromosome 1. Etc., etc., etc. Ultimately, we get a long list of genomic coordinates for all the reads, usually between 50 and 100 million reads. And we can use those reads to create a genome browser track. These are genes and chromosome positions in the mouse genome, MM10 to be exact. This is the track that we created for our ChIP-seq reads. A lot of reads map to this region, and relatively few reads map to these other regions. This track was made from a control experiment. The control track was made by taking some of the input chromatin from the original ChIP-seq experiment. And, without using an antibody to enrich for any particular protein, ungluing all the proteins and washing them off. Then sequencing, aligning, and converting into a track. In summary, the control track uses some of the same input chromatin for the ChIP-seq experiment, but doesn't try to enrich for any particular protein binding. We use the control track to verify that a high concentration of reads in the ChIP-seq track is due to a protein binding there, and not because a lot of reads map to a repetitive region. Statistically significant peaks are usually represented on genome tracks by rectangular bars. We could then compare peaks for the same protein in different cell types, like lung versus kidney. If we didn't know the specific DNA sequence that this green thing bound to, we could guess that it is a motif found in all of the peaks. Here's a motif found within the peaks that indicate where the green thing bound. The large letters are more frequently associated with the green thing than the little letters. We can also try to determine the functional role of the green thing by looking at where it binds relative to the genes. Here, we see that the green thing binds near the start of a gene, so it might regulate that gene in some way. Anyway, those are some of the things you can do with ChIP-seq. In summary, ChIP-seq identifies the locations in the genome bound by proteins. BAM! Hooray! We made it to the end of another exciting stat quest. If you like this stat quest and want to see more, please subscribe.
and if you want to support StatQuest, please click the like button and consider buying one of my original songs. Okay, until next time, quest on! So that's it. Thank you very much about Chipsick. Now comes the blotting techniques. I have few questions about review paper. When can I ask you, sir? So, okay, maybe not today, not tomorrow, or you can ask it here now. I can answer now. Uh, just feel free to ask it now. Just write it down here. I will uh, I reply to them to my best level. And students, whosoever has not subscribed to my channel, please subscribe. I feel a bit guilty to say this, but uh, this will help me to run my channel. I it could initiate my new life on YouTube. I'm I'm I have around 650 subscribers, 644. So I need 1,000 subscribers to start the YouTube channel. So I'm still very far away from that lead, and. Uh, yeah, so this is something will really help me to initiate it. Otherwise, it's fine. It's not necessary. So let's start with the next thing that is MBVT's topic of blotting techniques in which we will deal with the southern blotting, northern blotting and uh, western blotting, su southern western blotting, northern western blotting Southern blotting is done to check the DNA concentration, whereas Northern is to check the RNA concentration and Western is done to check the protein concentration. If we are doing Southern Western, that means uh, we are doing something related to the DNA and protein interaction. If we are doing Northern Western, that means we are doing something with the RNA and Western, RNA and protein interaction. And there is also dot blotting and zoo blotting that we will discuss in upcoming lecture. So, maybe I give you one uh, general view about writing a good review. Uh, soon after this, this lecture is over, then we can go to the next day lecture then afterwards. Let's finish this first. Plotting techniques, that is, forward to plug my mic. Sorry, so we will deal with the southern, northern, western, southern, western, northern, western, dot blotting and zoo blotting. So southern blotting uh, is, is, a, is a southern blot hybridization and, and target the DNA fragments that have been size fractioned by gel electrophoresis and this technique has been invented in the 1975 by E.M. Southern. In this technique, we exploit the property of radio level probe with a single standard DNA. If we want to detect the presence of a specific sequence in our mixed DNA samples, then we accordingly design the probe, which will have complementary sequence to our target sequence. So in this procedure, we, we call it southern blot because DNA sample is cleaved into restriction fragments with restriction endonuclease enzyme and fragments are separated apart by gel electrophoresis. So that's the major uh, thing that we have to take care. And the double standard And the double standard helix of each DNA fragment is then denatured into single standards by making pH of gel basics and the gel is blotted with a sheet of nitrocellulose transferring some of the DNA strands to sheet. 
So next, a probe containing a purified single standard DNA corresponding to a specific uh, gene is poured over the sheet. So any fragments that has nucleotide sequence complementary to the probe sequence will hybridize with the probe. If the probe has been uh, labeled with 32 phosphorus, it will be radioactive and the sheet will show a band of radioactivity where the probe is hybridized with the complementary fragments. So this is how uh, the, your gel is run uh, with the radioactive markers with specific sizes. You have a test nucleic site acids here and they run with electrophoresis. And then this gel has been transferred with the help of uh, nitrocellulose uh, membrane and all the material that is present in the gel will be transferred to the nitrocellulose membrane with the weight over, over top. Then you will, uh, things are separated, then you will uh, radioactively label with the nucleic acids and then you can see your hybridized results afterwards. So we get information from this uh, is to get to know about the particular genes are present, how many copies are present in the genome of organisms, degree of similarity between chromosomal gene and probe sequence, whether recognition sites for particular restriction endonuclease are present in the gene or by performing the digestion with different endonucleases or with the combination of endonucleases, it is possible to obtain section map of the gene. An idea of friction enzyme site in and around gene which will assist in the attempts to clone the gene and to rearrange the occur during the cloning process. So we use it uh, to detect cancer and genetic diseases like molecular leukemia population, sickle cell mutations, Use in DNA fingerprinting, genetic engineering and forensic science for tests under the paternity testing, personal identification, sex determination, species exclusions. So let's start with one of the southern blotting technique, how it is done. So there will be no sound. So you load your DNA samples uh, on 0.8% TB gel. Then denaturing solution uh, with sodium hydroxide and NaCl, 0 0.5 uh, normal and 1.5 molar NaCl. And we put them on the rock gel for 30 minutes in this denaturing solution. Then southern transfer, place a Wattman of 3 mm white Wattman paper then soak your filter paper in transfer buffer. Put your gel and put a nylon membrane on the gel. Then put Wattman paper, Wattman paper, two sheets of them. And cover the with plastic wrap both side. Add paper towels on top and add weights on top so that transfer could be done. Let it happen overnight. 
Then remove paper towels and filter papers. So take the membrane and SSC buffer. Then do crosslink you put into the UV transluminator. Put in the prehabilitation buffer to hybridize your membrane properly. So incubate at 42 degrees Celsius, rinse off, then now add you hybridization buffer, and add probe your isotope label DCTPs and hybridize overnight. Then you watch it, it's ready to expose uh, film with the uh, x-rays and you can watch the membrane later on. That's how it is done. That's it. Now comes the next part, uh, northern blotting. All is good here. Okay, Aisha, I will answer to your questions once we are done with this topic, then I will switch to review part. So northern blotting uh, is a simple extension of southern blotting, uh, which drives earlier technique and it's mainly the measurement of RNA in this case. So in this principle, RNA molecules are separated by size and detected on a membrane using a hybridization probe with a base sequence complementary to all or part of the sequence of target RNA. So RNA is extracted from the cell of interest, but precautions must be taken to avoid uh, degradation of single-stranded RNA by ribonuclease, which is found on the skin and on glasswares. So we are specific treated plastics and glasswares to accidentally introduce the ribonucleus to the extraction pep. So additionally, we add diethyl pyrocarbonate to inhibit the ribonucleus activity and also baking at high temperature destroys uh, ribonucleus activity also. Then uh, it is performed in these six steps. So first RNA is isolated from the several biological samples. Then RNA samples are separated according to the size of Negro's gel. The gel is then blotted on a nylon membrane. Then further hybridization is done with the buffer. RNA blots are done with the CNA DNA fragments. The membrane is washed to remove unbonded probe. Same, same steps that we have discussed before. 
same steps are going on then we check them with the RTU radiograph. So information that you get from northern blotting uh, is that you have a, per a particular pattern of particular gene in which gene tissue is expressed if it is expressed during certain stages of development and the quantity of mRNA presence uh, could, be, could be seen and whether a genomic DNA probe has regions that are transcribed. Then uses of northern blotting, uh, it is done to research to determine the gene expression patterns to detect cancer pancreatic cells and to enable scientists a function of unknown proteins and to detect the size of RNA. So it has, it, it has allows them to observe the alternate splice products using the probes with a partial homology. So it's the same method. Let's see a video about it. And but instead of uh, uh, chemicals that we used before, there will be some little different chemicals. So we prepare RNA sample for loading first with the help of RNA 15 microgram from, from amide, from aldehyde and mops. So we will add these four reagents to prepare our sample. We add loading dye to it. then gel is run <coughs> you check whether you your bands are run like it should be. So we will do the northern transfer afterwards, like the same like southern transfer. Then x SSC transfer buffer. You put Wattman paper first, then gel on top, then you add nylon membrane, then you add Wattman paper, then weights on top. So allow transfer to go overnight. <coughs> Cross linking with UV transluminator.
pre-hybridization buffer, then hybridization buffer. You add probes, isotopal lab, DCTPs. Wash them with wash buffer two times, repeat this for three times and on total. So membrane is ready to and you can see the results like the same. So now comes the western blotting which is an analytical technique used to detect specific proteins in a given sample of tissue homogenates sometimes referred to as a Im immune blotting and this is done to use a gel electrophores to separate native gels. We have discussed about electrophores yesterday in details but this is to be more about western blotting how it is done. So it is an analytical method wherein proteins is electrophoresed and as on SGS page and electro transferred into nitrocellulose membrane and the transfer protein is detected using specific primary antibody and secondary enzymes label antibody substrate. In this technique first of all sample of proteins is separated on the basis of the molecular mass uh, in the SGS page or in the 2D uh, dimensional gel and then electrophoresis moves the proteins from the gel onto the nitrocellulose membrane then we detect the specific antibody that is available to that a nitrocellulose membrane itself has non-specific sites that can bind proteins including antibodies then which should be blocked with non-specific protein solutions such as powdered milk then primary antibodies added into the milk solution then secondary antibodies attached to it then you can check the results with the help of uh, X photos or any some software to check these bands. So that's how you have you have nitrocellulose membrane with attached proteins. First, you add primary antibody to it, then secondary antibody. Then you can see the label pattern of a specific results. So we get information about size of protein, expression protein of amount of protein, and we get to know about HIV infections. Uh, we can get to know about bovine spongy form uh, and encephalopathy. Uh, so mad cow disease so it helps in to get to know about various diseases serious diseases so we will go um, about now one video about western blotting about 10 minutes video in this video you will learn how to perform a western blot a western blot can be used to identify specific proteins in a sample and provide information about the protein size and relative abundance in the sample First, fill a tray with blotting buffer. You will be using this buffer to equilibrate your gel prior to starting the western blot. Next, remove the gel from the gel cassette using the opening key. Line up the arrows on the opening lever with the four arrows on the cassette to open the cassette. After trimming the top and bottom of the gel with a straight edge, equilibrate the gel in the tray with blotting buffer for 15 minutes on a rocking platform. Pre-soak fiber pads in blotting buffer so that they are thoroughly soaked. To make a blotting sandwich, 
obtain a container large enough to fit the gel holder and add enough blotting buffer until the container is filled approximately one centimeter deep. Place the gel holder cassette in the container with the black side down and immersed in the buffer and the white side up and out of the buffer. Lay one fiber pad flat on the black plastic. Next, wet a piece of blotting paper and place it on top of the pad. Be careful to avoid any bubbles between the pad and the paper and make certain the buffer covers the paper. Take the gel and carefully place it squarely onto the blotting paper. Again, being careful to avoid any bubbles between the gel and the blotting paper. Next, you will be applying a piece of nitrocellulose membrane. Remove the protective sheet from the membrane and wet the membrane with blotting buffer. Carefully place the membrane squarely on the gel. Avoid moving the membrane once placed on the gel as proteins will begin to blot immediately. Using a roller, remove any air bubbles between the gel and the membrane. Place a second sheet of wet blotting paper on top of the nitrocellulose membrane. Place a second wet fiber pad on top of the blotting paper. Fold the clear plastic side of the gel holder over the sandwich and clamp it to the black plastic side by sliding over the white clip. This tight fit will squeeze the sandwich together. Insert the gel holder into the inner module. Make certain that the black side of the gel holder is next to the black side of the module. Place the inner module into the electrophoresis chamber. Add a frozen cooling unit and fill the chamber with blotting buffer to the level of the white clip on the gel holder. Place the lid on the electrophoresis chamber. Connect the electrical leads to the power supply, making sure the connections are correct, red to red and black to black. Turn on the power supply and run the block. If a timer is available, set it for two and a half hours. When the run is complete, turn off the power supply and disassemble the electrophoresis chamber and remove the inner module. Open the module and place it in a container filled with blotting buffer with the black side down. Starting with the first fiber pad, remove each layer until you reach the nitrocellulose membrane. As you remove the membrane, note that the proteins have been transferred from the gel to the membrane. Note that the kaleidoscope pre-stain standards have been transferred and can be seen on both sides of the membrane. You can also see that there are no longer any proteins on the gel. Immerse the membrane in 25 milliliters of blocking solution and incubate it for 15 minutes at room temperature on a rocking platform.
pour off the blocking solution. Add 10 milliliters of primary antibody. Incubate for 10 to 20 minutes on a rocking platform. The platform should be set at a faster setting to ensure constant coverage of the membrane. Pour off the primary antibody. Rinse the membrane quickly in 50 milliliters of wash buffer and then discard the wash buffer. Add another 50 milliliters of wash buffer to the membrane and let it wash for three minutes on the rocking platform at a medium speed setting. Discard the wash buffer. Add 10 milliliters of secondary antibody and incubate the membrane for 5 to 15 minutes on the rocking platform at a fast speed. Pour off the secondary antibody. Rinse the membrane quickly in 50 milliliters of wash buffer and discard the wash buffer. Additional 50 milliliters of wash buffer and wash the membrane for three minutes on the rocking platform on a medium speed setting. Discard the wash buffer. Add 10 milliliters of substrate. Incubate the membrane with the substrate for 10 to 30 minutes with either manual shaking or on a rocking platform. Watch for the color development. Once the colors have developed, rinse the membrane twice with distilled water and blot dry with the paper towel. Air dry for 3 to 60 minutes and then cover in plastic wrap for storage. So that was about western blotting. Now southern western blotting is a technique which is done to, it's a mixture of southern blotting and western blotting discovered by Bowen et al and used to identify DNA binding proteins that specifically interact with the chosen DNA fragments in sequence specific manner. Then northern western blotting is a combination of northern western blotting and western blotting. This technique identifies the protein RNA interaction in which protein is run on the gel and blotted with labeled RNA of interest. Then dot blotting it's a modified version of western blotting which is used for identification and analysis of protein of interest and dot blot methodology differs from the traditional western blotting technique by not separating uh, protein samples using electrophoresis. So sample proteins are instead spotted onto membranes and hybridized with an antibody probe. Then comes the zoo blotting. Zoo blotting is to check between different species, different organisms 
their uh, their interactions how how the coding and non coding regions are present so so zoo blotting is based on the principle of southern blotting in the genome of any organisms there are two regions the coding and non coding regions so it is coding region that causes interest for most of the researcher as it is associated with the genetic information for specific protein but the problem is that most of the regions of dna are non coding and the question is how to identify coding regions in large amount of non coding dna so zoo blotting is precisely used to distinguish coding dna from non coding regions and during evolutions the base sequence of non coding dna mutates and changes rapidly and whereas a coding sequence changes much more slowly and can still uh, be recognized after millions of years of divergence uh, between two species so here you can see uh, we have a probe with the non coding regions bind to itself only in the human beings and this is the probe is coding dna all species have related sequence so rat cow dog human like this so in this technique the probe is a segment of human that may or may not from the coding regions and blotting is carried out in, at, as a an usual way so on the left the only hybrid seen was between the probe and human dna therefore related sequence were not found in other species uh, in the non coding dna so in in the sample on the right the probe bends to related sequence in the other animals therefore this piece of dna is probably from the coding region so the coding regions will come from that specific region of human like this 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 but that was not present in the non coding regions so that's it from the today's perspective so we are done actually for today's lecture so blotting technique oh ho this is more than 100 mb so i cannot share this so here is the link for today's techniques body techniques so now let's come to the topic of review um so few questions about review how many references so maybe i can share my paper with you all of you so when i was writing my paper so i used almost 50 uh, references 
or 60 but you can use 20 to 30 references also is fine you can use also 10 references but they should have some specific role So like this you have to use uh, references as per required and about you have second question was something with the plagiarism. Most of the content is taken from references, books and papers. Uh, yeah, you can take from references, books and papers. So try to take as much. So in my case, I took all everything from PubMed. So I took all the stuff that I want to publish. That was from PubMed, some references. I didn't took any book actually. So mainly no Wikipedia, uh, no nothing like that. But mainly the papers. Olson, J at all, Gotse at all, um, Fute, Simon, this, these dissociations, so like this. So I use different references as per the required by the comp, uh, by the general. So it will always be asked by the uh, by the general how they want it. Okay. So I will share my paper also so that you can have a view how a paper is written so that there is no problem for the later. So here I will take a 5 minutes break students so it's 21.5 I see you at 21.10 and then we start with the tomorrow session uh, with basics of fluorescence. Applications of fluorescence activated cell sorting. So give me a second, so I will come back. You meet in five minutes.
So So it should not be copied actually, you should write in your own words. So whatever you're writing, you can write in paraphrasing it and start to write after reading like 25 papers, you will have understanding of the topic and start writing it in your own words so that, um, so that you, you are um, not being plagiarized. So 15% to 25% is fine. But it should not be more than that. No. Not from the single paper. I mean from the whole, from the all papers. So total 25% is fine. Not from the single paper. You have to change the topic name at least. Uh, if you write the same topic, then how you will be different from others. So you have to change the name somehow. You have to... Show the world that you have produced something new so that people want to read it. Otherwise, it will be waste of your time and the reader's time. So you have to write something that is uh, of use for everyone. Yeah. So fundamentals and applications of fluorescence activated cell sorting. So topics covered in this seminar. Um, so we have to understand the basics of flow of cytometry, understand how flow of cytometry sorter works, understands how cells are sorted out, description of different sorting possibilities, tips on sample preparations, overview of sorting services provided by FCF. So what techniques are appropriate for if you want to sell separate so you can separate them by fluid particle suspension or the tissue so you have two samples type and the t fluid uh, suspensions particles they could be separated by fluorescence <coughs> activated cell sorting fax microfluidics and large particles where the tissue itself could be separated by laser micro dissection uh, microscopy So what is flow cytometry? Flow cytometry is basically a flow of liquids, cytos of fluid cells and measurements. So flow, fluids are flowing uh, and cells mean cyto and metre means measurements. So it's a measurement of fluid cells, flow cytometry. <coughs> so what are the types of particles can we analyze? So you can analyze cells, chromosomes, bacteria, yeast, microparticles, all these are possible uh, things. And what particle size can be analyzed? You can analyze bacteria, phytoplankton, red blood cells, uh, lymphocytes, neutrophil, monocytes, smaller to larger. Any size could be uh, measured in this. So what are the three key parameters that are measured in this? That is the relative size, relative internal complexity, and relative fluorescence intensity. So all these in the facts analysis, relative size, internal complexity, and relative fluorescence intensity, intensity. Uh, being measured so, so samples are running the analyzer so they are the various analyzers by the company BD biosciences uh, could you could be seen there here itself uh, sorter can be divided into three main subsystems that is fluidics optics and electronics so fluidics is to introduce the focus the cells for inter uh, interrogations and create a stable break-off for sorting optics to generate the collect the light signals 
electronics uh, to convert the optical signals to uh, proportional digital signals, process the signals and communicate with the computer. <coughs> so you have how you can recure individual cells. A so sample is introduced into the running sheet of fluid in this flow cell. So your samples are running here in the central core and the sample is hydrodynamically focused in the core stream. So they have hydrodynamically core in the focus stream. So sheet fluid, this fluid which is outside and the sample, they do not mix with each other. And reduction of cross section causes an acceleration of central core stream to the laminar mm -hmm. fluidex. The cells will flow from top to the bottom and then sample flows are rate adjustable. So there are two different optic systems in sorter. Excitations to optics consisting of layers fiber optic cables that carry beam to steering prisms which then direct uh, laser beams to the stream. So we have fiber optics here, X mount or optical plates, prisms, flow cells like this. So there are two different optics uh, systems in, in sorter. So this collecting optic assist, uh, consist of fiber optics and filters. So filters could be arranged in this form, trigon and octagon, the three A, B, C and here is A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H like in this case. And further, uh, uh, there is photon multiply, uh, multiplied tube is there also, PMT in which your photons are multiplied with the help of dynodes in many uh, higher mm. amplifications. So how cells are actually sorted? Uh, cells are sorted like this. So you have cells coming from the top, samples generates light <coughs> scatters and fluorescent signals are analyzed. Then charge is applied by the stream charging wire. And then further charge droplets break off. Then deflection plates attracts replied charge particles. So charge could be positive or negative and some will be neutral. So he here there will be positive plate, this will be negative plate. So positive will have negative charge particles and negative will have positive charge particles. So in between with the wasted uh, cells, which I have no, no charge, they will move away like that. So charge dropping containing particles are collected and uncharged droplet pass to waste. So this is a basic principle of cell sorting. <coughs> so then there is an interrogation point, then there is a break off of it. Then live image of stream taken from the live video monitor mm -hmm. is shown here. Drops are visible. And here you can see the drops are visible and then started to become small and small like this. So what collection devices can I sort my samples? You can sort your samples uh, with the purpose of enrichment of cell culture, DNA RNA analysis, adoptive transfer, purification of cells, expressing the fluorescent protein. So cells can be sorted into 1.5 ml tubes, 5 ml fax tubes, 15 ml tubes, break beaker and samples can be cooled or uncooled. You can also sort them into 3, 6 to 384 well plates also to check about tissue culture, TNB, cell clonal expansion, single cell DNA, RNA analysis. So all things could are possible. Then slide sorts are done with the purpose of sorting directly into the slides that can be used for in vitro assays and then could be sorted into microscopy slides, EBD type chamber slides and only one population can be sorted in that case. So some quick tips, plan your experiments before with which antibodies you have to use, fluorescent antibodies and bring along the controls also which controls has to be used and maximum of 2% of FCS, BCS has recommended to be used and avoid phenol, red media due to autofluorescence. Most cell types uh, will do well in just, just PBS and FCS. So use of calcium magnesium free sorting uh, buffer or add EDTA to that. Uh, if self preparation induced increased cell lysis, use 25 microgram of DNAs and 5 millimolar of magnesium chloride. Use of 1% acutase in sorting buffer. So all samples need to be filtered preferably directly before sorting and for bulk sort provide cell with the following concentrations depending on the used no nozzles. So these kinds of nozzles you can have these much of cells per ml. And minimum sample volume for sorting is 200 microliter and samples can be loaded for 
from 1.5 ml Appendorf to 5 ml fax tubes and 15 ml uh, falcon tubes. So volatile harmful substances such as uh, such as 2 mercap ethanol and triazoles are not allowed in doing the sample analysis. So we have learned about measuring the analysis of in, in our sorters, possibility to sort from the smallest bacteria to largest adipocytes, plan your fluoroform, fluorochrome panel according to the optical configuration of the sorter to be used, prepare your samples following our guidelines. So do not forget to use controls in this case and bring appropriate collection media for your downstream techniques. So thank you from the uh, on the behalf of Vedro Fabrica team um, for getting to know about little bit about facts analysis. So I will share you now um, this topic with you, and also uh, we will go through some video session now with the flow cytochemistry, so that we are on the good panel then afterwards. So keep uh, everyone be with me, don't go for sleep <coughs> until we finish today's topic. So now some exciting topics we will be covering now. So let's start the topic uh, with the next part. In this video, I'm going to speak about a very important or very very interesting mechanism called the flow cytometer and fax. Uh, actually, I did two videos, so in this video I'm going to mention specifically flow cytometer, and in the next video I'm going to mention the fax mechanism, fluorescence activated cell sorting. Uh, let's start speaking about flow cytometer. Uh, flow cytometer is a cell counting mechanism, uh, so it's used to count the cells and to, get, to analyze the phenotype and the health situation of the cell. Uh, how does it work in general first? In general, in flow cytometer, I have something called the flow cell. In the flow cell, we add our um, cell mixture. Uh, then I have the sheath fluids. The sheath fluids will apply something called the hydrodynamic focusing. The hydrodynamic focusing of the sheath fluids will send the cells one by one through the uh, flow cytometer tube. It's very important to to pass the cell, one, the cells one by one through the uh, through the tube, because here I have something called the laser beam, and this the cells should pass through the laser laser beam uh, one by one. This point where when uh, where the cells pass through the laser beam is called the interrogation point. Now, when the cell pass through the laser beam, there are two events happening. First, is the forward scattering, which is the light scattered in an acute angle uh, to the forward direction, and the side scattering, which is the light scattered in um, in, a, in every other di direction, in side directions. These two events, or this uh, light scatter, uh, scattering, is detected by specific detectors called the forward detector uh, and the side detectors. And these detectors are uh, connected to a PC or a data analysis uh, anal uh, analyzer, which is going to analyze the data uh, obtained from the uh, detectors. Now, this is in general. Now I'm going to speak in more in details. Saying that this is the uh, flow cytometer, flow cytometer tube, and then the cells pass one by one through the laser beam. When the cell pass through the laser beam, the cells scatter the light in a forward direction, which is in an, a, the light scattered in an acute angle. This forward scattered light is directly proportional to the size of the cell. Why? Because the cells scatter as like a particular amount of light 
in the forward direction. But when the cell is bigger, the cell the um, forward is larger or like um, yeah more um, more scat more forward scattered light will be detected. And when the cell is smaller, the cell will scatter less light in the forward direction. So the forward scattered light is directly proportional to the size of the cell. Now the detector detects the pulse of photons, um, which are the light scattered. The forward scattered light is a pulse of photons, which are detected by the detector, and the detector then is, as I told you before, is uh, connected to a PC or a computer. The PC will convert the intensity of the light detected by the detector into voltage. And then I will get a specific amount of voltage for every cell passing through the laser beam. The PC will give me a data similar to this. So every time a cell passes through the laser beam, I will get a specific peak, um, like high voltage peak for large cells and low voltage peaks for small cells. The data or the forward scattered light data at the end will be similar to this time versus voltage and then the peak will be uh, proportional to the size of the cell. This is forward scattered light. The second event happening in the flow, uh, flow cytometer is the side scattered light. So when a, when a cell path through the laser beam, the cell will scatter the light in side direction. And this side scattered light is directly proportional to the complexity and granularity of the cell. Why? Because the uh, simple cells uh, scatter the light in the side direction. Yes, but when we have granules inside the cell, so when the cell is complex from inside, these little granules will also scatter the light in different directions. And in this case, I will get more side scattered light like this. So this is a complex cell from inside, it contains uh, small granules inside, and then these granules will also scatter the light in different directions, and in this case I would get um, higher intensity of the side scattered light. Similarly to what we saw in forward scattered light, the, the detector are, detectors are um, uh, connected to the PC, which is going to convert the intensity of the light into voltage. And then uh, I'll get something similar to this. So the side scattered light data will be similar to the forward scattered light data. So for uh, the, 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 the complex cells will give me a high peak and the simple cells will give me a, a small peak. Now, in order to analyze uh, the cells, what I have to do is that I have, I, I can do, I can combine both forward scattered light and side scattered light data together. In, in this case, I'll get something called the two-dimensional histogram. The two-dimensional histogram from its name, it's two-dimensional. So I have side scatter and forward scatter data all together. In this case, what I get is something similar to this. So I have here four quadrants. If the cell appear in the lower quadrants, it means that it has low signal on the size scatter detectors, which means that the cell is simple. If the cell appears in the upper uh, in the upper half, it means that it gives a uh, high signal on the side scatter detectors, so it means that the cell is complex. If the cell appear on the right half, it means that the cell give high signal on the forward scatter, which means that the cell is big. And if the cell appears here, it means that the cell is small. So if the cell appears, for example, in this quadrant, it means that the cell is small and it's simple. If the cell appears here, it means that the cell is small but it's complex. Here, it means that the cell is big and complex. And here, it means that the cell is big but simple. I will give you a very good example of this, um, which uh, I have a, 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 an example about um, the analysis of a sample of white blood cells. 
So what we see here is an analysis of what white blood cells. This is like scatter and this is forward scatter light. What we see here is uh, a group of cells which are complex, very comp complex cells because they give a uh, high signal on the side scatter detector and they are medium inside. They are not so big and they are not small, so th they are medium inside. Obviously, these cells are granulocytes because granulocytes, or like as you know, few bars of your neutrophils, they are medium inside, but they are very complex cells. <clears throat> Here we have bigger cells because they give almost like uh, they give uh, more or less high uh, signal on the forward scatter, but they give low signal on the side scatter. So they are big, but they are not complex. They are simple cells, and these are monocytes because monocytes are big cells, but they are not complex. Here we have very simple cells because they give very low uh, signal on the side scatter, and they are like. Um, uh, smaller than monocytes and granulo, uh, granulocytes. So obvious, obviously these are lymphocytes because the lymphocytes are smaller in size and they are uh, simple cells. Of course this is a very useful technique <clears throat> used to, uh, to count the cells uh, and to analyze the phenotype and the health situation of the cells. And what's very special about this technique is that we can analyze many thousands of particles and cells per second um, it's like a, it's an easy technique it's not um, very hard to, 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 to perform and it's precise it's very used nowadays in, uh, in all the laboratories um, this is everything I wanted to, to tell you about um, flow cytometer which is very important to know if you want to know more about fax mechanism in the next video, I'll speak about fa fax mechanism. So let's go to the fax. Hello, guys. This is a continuation of our, uh, the subject flow cytometer and fax mechanism. In the previous video, I spoke in details about flow cytometer. And this, in this video, I'm going to speak about fax mechanism, fluorescence activated cell sorting. If you didn't watch the previous video, I highly recommend you to go and watch it because it will be much easier to understand fax mechanism if you, underst if you fully understand the flow cytometer mechanism. So let's start speaking about fax. Fax mechanism is not only a, a cell counting mechanism, but it's all, also a cell sorting mechanism. So it provides a method to uh, sort a heterogeneous mixture of biological cells. Uh, it depends on light scattering, as we saw in flow cytometer, so uh, forward scattering in light and uh, side scattering light, but it also depends on the fluorescence and it also can detect uh, fluorescence. Fax mechanism looks like this, so we have the machine, we have of course the computer which is going to analyze the data, and we have uh, the fluids container and the waste container. Now, how does it work? Fax a fax machine looks like this from inside. So uh, we have also the flow cell and the sheath fluids, which apply the hydrodynamic forces on the cell to pat them one, one by one through the, uh, through the tube. This is what we saw in flow cytometer in the previous uh, video. The cells will pass one by one through the uh, through the cell tube, and then we have the laser. So the the cells will pass through the laser beam one by one. When the cell pass through the laser beam, um, there is the flow uh, uh, forward scatter, which is detected by the forward scatter de detector, and then there is the side scatter, which is detected by the side scatter detector. But here there is also the fluorescence, which is detected by the fluorescence detectors. Uh, here we have mirrors and uh, filters, which are aimed to filter the light and to deliver a particular wavelength to the appropriate detector. Then everything, uh, all the detectors are uh, connected to the computer, which is going to analyze the data. Now let's speak more in details. <clears throat> 
Um, as we saw in forward scatter in, in flow cytometer, we have forward scatter and light and side scatter. Here we have also the fluorescence. So saying that I have a cell mixture. Inside this mixture, I have a mixture of cells or uh, cells who are expressing a particular protein and other cells who are not expressing the particular proteins, pro, uh, pro, the particular protein or the protein of interest. What I want to do here is I want to count how many cells there is inside the mixture and how many cells are expressing the protein and how many cells are not expressing the protein. And then I want to separate this heterogeneous mixture into two groups of cells, the, the cells who are expressing the protein and the cells who are not expressing the protein. To do this, first of all, I have to design a specific antibody for this protein. This antibody is specific to the protein of my interest. Uh, I'm not like I, I can buy this protein. There are companies who uh, design specific antibodies for particular proteins. Then I have to uh, label this antibody with a specific fluorophore. Now, what I have to do is that I have to add this antibody uh, labeled or labeled antibody to the mixture of cells I have. When the protein, when the antibody is add added to the cells, this antibody is going to bind specifically to the protein of my interest and then I will have labeled cells. So I, ha I will have cell the cells who are expressing the protein will be labeled with this uh, fluorophore. Now, when the cell path through the, the laser beam, this is going to happen. First, I will get the forward, uh, forward scat, uh, scattered light, which is detected by the forward scatter detector. And this is proportional to the size, as we saw in the previous, the, uh, we, we, we saw this in details in the previous video. So forward scattered light is directly proportional to the size of the cell, side scattered light is directly proportional to the complexity of the cell, and then the fluorescence will give me an information about which one of the cells is expressing the protein and which one of the cells is not expressing the protein. Now when the cell path through the, path through the laser beam, this is the laser beam. First of all, this is the forward scattered, which is uh, detected by the uh, by the forward scatter detector. The side scatter, which is detected by the side scatter detectors. Um, and then I will ha and then when this when the fluorophore pass through the laser beam, the fluorophore will be excited. And then when the fluorophore is excited, uh, the fluorophore will emit light at a particular wavelength. And then this light will be detected by the fluorophore detectors. All these detectors are connected to the computer, which is going to give me. Um, the exact data about every event of these three. Now, of course, when the cell is expressing more proteins, there will be more fluorescent, fluorescence coming, up, coming, up, coming out of this cell. At the end, I will get a data similar to this. So when the cell is expressing the protein, I will get a high peak. And then when the cell is not expressing the protein, I will get a small peak. And then the computer will give me something called the one-dimensional histogram, which is something similar to, to this. Here we have the cell count or the events, we call them the events passing through the laser beam. And here we have the signal of the fluorophore. So when I have a high signal of fluorophore, then, the, um, then these cells are the cells who are expressing the protein of interest. And the cells who give low signal on the fluorescence detectors are the cells who are not expressing the protein. What I can do further is to combine this data with other data as I have. So for example, I can uh, combine the data obtained from the fluorescence detectors with the data obtained from the forward scatter detectors, for example. So here I have the fluorophore, here I have the forward scatter, or here I have the fluorescence and forward scattered light. When the cell appear here, uh, it means that these, ce these cells are small cells because they have low signal on the forward scatter and they have low signal on the fluorescence detectors, so they are not expressing the protein. 
when the cell appear here, it means that the cell is not expressing the protein because it has low fluorescence, but it's a big cell because it, ha it has high signal on the forward scattered light. Then when the cell appear here, it means that it's expressing the protein, but it's a small cell. And when the cell appear on the upper right quadrant, it means that the cell is big and it's expressing the protein. So this is what we call, sorry, this is what we call the two-dimensional histogram. I can combine two data together and then I get something like this. Now what's special about fax mechanism or what it, why it's called fax? Fax means fluorescence activated cell sorting, which means that this mechanism cannot only give me a, a cell count, cannot give me a data about the cell count or um, the percentage of the cell uh, expressing the protein and not expressing the protein, but also the fax can separate the cell mixture into two groups of cells. How does it work? Let's see. This is the fax mechanism. So here we have the uh, flow cell and here we have the cells passing one by, by one through the laser beam. When the cells pass one by one through the laser beam, uh, as we saw before, it will scatter light forward and, light sca and side scatter light and also fluores uh, fluorescence. All these events will be detected by the detector. At the end of the tube, there is something called drop formation. In drop formation, we have a mechanism called a vibrating mechanism. This vibrating mechanism will separate my mixture into small droplets. These droplets should contain only one cell by droplet. This is very important. Then what I can do as a user is that I can uh, adjust the settings, the settings of the uh, of the program, in order to charge the cells. So at the end of the tube, I have something called the electrical charging ring. The electrical charging ring is responsible to charge the cells according to my adjustment. So, for example, if I adjust the settings, for example, of the um, of the program, uh, I can ask the computer to charge the high fluorescent cells with a positive charge and the low fluorescent cells with a negative charge. Then the the, the electrical charging ring will charge the highly the cells will pass through the laser beam, the detector will detect the fluorescence, and then the computer will charge the high fluorescent cell with, with, negative, with positive charge, for example, and the low fluorescent cells with negative charge. I can choose, actually. For example, if I have this data, this is a, the two-dimensional histogram, I can choose to... Um, charge uh, the, the big, uh, big high fluorescent cells with a positive charge and the big low fluorescent cells with a negative charge and the other cells with, the, with no charge. Then the neutral cells will go to the waste. Uh, these cells might be like debris. These might be like uh, just debris. I, I'm not interested in them. So I'm, uh, It depends what cells I'm interested in. So I can adjust the settings of the program and then the, pro the, the electrical charging ring will charge the cells. Then I, will, I, I have different electrodes like negative and positive electrodes and then the positive uh, cells will go to the negative electrodes and the po negative cells will go to the positive electrodes and the neutral cells will go to the waste. In this case I will have two uh, groups of cells, the cells who are expressing the protein and the cells who are not expressing the protein. And this is what we call cell sorting. Of course, I can also um, study two proteins, not only one. And this is done by using different... Uh, so, of course, to study two proteins, I, I need two specific antibodies because I need one specific antibody for each protein. But I need to label every antibody with a different uh, fluorophore. Of course, I have different fluorophores, and every fluorophore emits light in a different wavelength. I need to know um, every fluorophore, the, the, the wavelength every fluorophore emits light in. So um, if I use two different fluorophores, then I can uh, study two different um, 
proteins. For example, this fluorophore emits light, uh, emits a green light or a light green light, and this fluorophore emits yellow light. So they are different wavelength. Um, then, if this cell is emitting only uh, ha or has only a green fluorophore, we can know that this cell is expressing one protein or the green protein. Uh, if the cell is emitting yellow, li yellow light, then the cell is expressing only the second protein. And if the cell is emitting two lights, then the, or giving two signals on the two detectors, uh, then we can say that the cell is expressing both proteins. Um, how can we detect two different wavelengths? As I, as I showed you before, um, the fax mechanism contains different detectors, different fluorescence detectors, and here we have the uh, filters, the light filters, which deliver a particular wavelength to the uh, to a particular detector. So every detector we detect a particular wavelength, and then we can use two different flu fluorophores if they emit light uh, on different wavelength. Okay. Um, we can also combine the data together. So I can uh, uh, like form this two-dimensional histogram again, but, but, but with the protein one and protein two. So I have fluorophore one, signal coming from fluorophore one and fluorophore two. So when the cells are in, the, in, in this, uh, so when the cells are here, it means that these cells are expressing both proteins because they are giving high signal on uh, the first de detector on, on the second detector. Uh, if the cells are here, it means that they are expressing uh, protein two, but they are not expressing protein one. These cells are expressing protein one because they have high signal on uh, the detector of fluorophore 1, but they are not expressing protein 2 because they have low signal of the on the detector of fluorophore 2. And these cells are not expressing any of the proteins. Um, now I have like a real uh, two-dimensional histogram. Um, and this is like ideal to see how cells are shown in the two-dimensional histogram. So these cells, here we are studying two different proteins, CD14 and CD4. We are labeling CD14 with PE, and we are labeling CD4 with feed C. We are labeling them with different uh, fluorophores. Then cells in this quadrum are expressing CD14, but uh, they are not expressing CD4, so we have CD4 min uh, uh, negative. Cells here are expressing both. They are giving high signal on both of them. So the CD14 positive, CD4 positive. These cells are CD14 and CD4 negative, negative, because they are giving low signal on both detectors. And these cells are expressing CD4. They are giving high signal on CD4 detector, or on feed C detector, but they are giving low signal on the other detector. So they are expressing only CD4. This is like a very simple example about how the data looks like in the two-dimensional histogram. Of course, there are many, many, many uh, more complex data. So if you want me, uh, I cannot speak about everything in this video. So if you want me to do another video, especially about data analysis and gating, um, in fact, uh, uh, in fact, analysis. Please write me in the comment. One um, fax machine in the in the market, which contains ten lasers. Detectors. Can you imagine ten lasers and thirty detectors? So you can you can. Uh... Oh, there is some more. We I should share these two presentations with you.